Hey everybody, my name is Chris Lundwall. I'm an umpire here in Colorado. Uh, for the last couple of years, I've been asked to provide some uh, educational content for training new umpires and refreshing with with the more with uh, the seasoned folks as well. And uh, we have some great conversations here in Colorado Springs when we talk about uh, the preseason and get ready for the year. Um, one of the things that I'm asked to focus on of the benefit of the group is the strike zone specifically and how it impacts game management. We've got this thing called the 80% rule that basically says 80% of the things that go, can go right uh, will go extremely right during a baseball game if the strike zone is consistent and accurate. And 80% of things that can go wrong will probably go wrong if the strike zone is not accurate and consistent. And that may seem really, really, really obvious to everybody, and I'm sure it is. But uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the mechanics today of making sure the strike zone is as solid as possible. Um, the metaphor that we like to use, or that I like to use, certainly is boating. If you go out on the lake, uh, you've got a lot of expectations, uh, just like fans and coaches and players have expectations of baseball games. And uh, when you get out on that lake, the most fundamental expectation you've got is that your boat will float. Everything you've got planned from, uh, you know, eating lunch on the boat to tanning on the boat to water skiing behind the boat or just kicking back on the boat is fundamentally tied to one fundamental presumption about the boat floating. Um, it's the same way with the strike zone. Everybody who comes to that baseball game has one fundamental common expectation, and that is the accuracy and the consistency of that strike zone. So, um, and truly uh, just about everything that happens during that game, uh, if, this, if the zone is solid, can be managed in a really, really positive way. And if the zone is not solid, it just exacerbates and accumulates tension and can create all kinds of um, unfortunate situations. So again, I don't wanna belabor this, but that's the metaphor that I'd like to offer up. And so uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into it. The goal of this, the goal of this training is, especially during COVID this year, is for any, uh, our association, anyone who wants to use this, since we can't really congregate like we have in the past for trainings and preseason uh, meetings, um, this is really designed to be uh, a YouTube resource for any training organization that feels like it adds some value, especially with the younger and the new umpires. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let's see. Okay, uh, context for today, uh, really straightforward. Um, there's volumes written on the strike zone. Um, there's better content out there for sure. This is fairly uh, this is fairly amateur to be sure, but it's got good intentions and if it adds value, then it's met its objective. Uh, my background really briefly is about 11 umpiring seasons. I had to go to, had the opportunity to go to some awesome schools and um, to learn from just some amazing umpires at all levels. And um, but really the goal here today is educational. If you enjoy improving and this helps, then we've met our goal. Um, also, I want to I want to put a plug in for sure as it relates to going to schools, um, whether that's going to an MLB uh, school uh, or going to a local uh, RMAC or NC2A school. I really, really, really encourage you to do that. The focus of this presentation today is is for me not to share so much what's actually in the rule book but to share with you many of the things that I've been taught at these schools um, on and off the field, but mostly off the field, conversations, tips, recommendations, again, game management type of uh, encouragement that really, really has helped me throughout the years and just made me enjoy uh, the game and enjoy uh, umpiring much, much more. Uh, so I would really encourage you, there's a couple here that are listed um, that, that you can take a look at. There's more online. Uh, here in Colorado, RMAC puts on a great clinic in August, September usually, and um, I just recommend that you, you spend the money, invest in it as quickly as you can, especially not, not try, to, try not to get to year three before you go to at least one school. Um, if your experience is even similar to mine, you're going to, when you're going to hit, you're going to hit year three or four as an umpire, and you're doing a lot of games, and you're going to get to that point where you have several mentors and you go to different games and get paired up with different partners and you're going to start to get just a ton of different opinions and you're really not going to know what true north is even though you've got a rule book etc so at that point you kind of want to attenuate or address that frustration by just going to school and figuring out what your own true north is find out from the pros and from the nc2a uh, experts you know what they recommend and why 
And that will get you settled in your own mind about where you want to go with your umpiring and specifically about what you want to, how you want to address specific situations, specific topics. But it's really, really, really important, in my opinion, that you find your own umpiring voice um, before you, you kind of start to face that wall of, of conflicting opinions and confusion, if you will, uh, by asking maybe a few too many people for too many opinions. Take that for what it's worth. The other thing I would say is invest in your equipment. Uh, I came across Force 3 Pro Gear when I went to pro school in 2013, I believe it was. Uh, and I, I just can't tell you how valuable this equipment is. It is superior to, in terms of technology. It's safer, it's easier to use. The mask has the suspension system built into it. Um, the chest has Kevlar. Uh, I've had the opportunity to do, like I said, everything from Little League in the early days to high school uh, to college level ball. And uh, I, just, I just can't even tell you how valuable investing a little bit of extra money in to these, these force through products is. It literally, it literally makes a massive difference in terms of longevity and safety, in my opinion, and um, I just can't recommend it highly enough. Uh, as far as game management pillars go, um, there's four things that I've looked at over the, over the years that have really, really helped me kind of get my head around what makes a really, really good game from an umpire's perspective. And this is after studying, and this is after your pregame at the, at, the, at the plate with the coaches. So again, just take this topic, Lee, but if I've found that if you got confidence at the plate in terms of an accurate, consistent strike zone and your communication has a tone that, that is responsible and affirmative, um, that just is, is an awesome pillar to build on. The second pillar is mobility on the bases. If you've got angle and distance illustrated on every play with mobility, uh, it's just very, very difficult to miss calls or to frustrate anybody with the way you're conducting yourself out there. Um, timing on, on calls, again, composed, never rushed. Uh, when you go to school, and if you've been to some of the local schools or your, your association schools, pause, read, and react is just so important. It never gets old. It's always appropriate. So timing on calls makes a huge statement about game management and how qualified you are to be on that, on that field that day. And then respect everybody, be collegial, but not familial. What I mean by that is, Again, in a COVID environment, this isn't gonna sound right, but collegial to me is a handshake and it's a professional type of relationship and distance and understanding. Familial is more like a big hug and high fives and, and that being that close to people, players, coaches um, is, is not uh, what's recommended and it can really create some huge, huge issues, obviously on a, from a game management perspective. So always being positive on the verbal side, and positive on the body language side is a great way to illustrate your respect for the game and your respect for other people. So again, from a game management perspective, those are the four things that if they go really well, um, it's, it's probably gonna create a great day, no matter what happens on the field. And um, these are the things that, that, that I've found at the, before the game, if I focus on these, and then after the game, if I look at these four categories and kind of evaluate myself, it, it helps me um, try to improve every single game. Floating the boat first. So let's jump right into it. Confidence at the plate. Uh, so there's talking the talk and there's walking the walk. And I think that when you're, what I would recommend you consider is that when you're at the plate meeting, that's where you're talking the talk. We're being brief. We're, we're talking about safety, ground rules, unique tournament rules that may apply. We're trying to be very, very succinct and clear. Here's, you know, about time, about tempo, about where the balls are coming in and the communications that we're going to allow and support. Um, what I would, what I would say here is, if your tone at the plate is positive, constructive, and and relatively brief. Uh, you're off to a really good start in terms of talking the talk and leading that into a place where you can walk the walk. Where I would um, offer some, some, something for the, the umpires to consider that are doing the 12U and the 14U tournaments during the summers is that um, I have a huge amount of respect for the umpires who do that category because it takes so much patience uh, to manage the coaches 
and and the staff and the players and the parents because that's it's so educational, right? I mean, that's that's the the time frame where 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 the players are moving from little league up to high school. They're not aware of a lot of the rule changes. The parents, most cases, are not aware of the rule changes. And unfortunately, the coaches aren't always aware of the rule changes. And it's just not the rule changes to consider. It's the decorum. It's the expectation. So as an umpire, we're trying to help them in a very kind yet yet clear way migrate and elevate and evolve to a higher baseball IQ. And uh, that can be a challenge sometimes in those tournaments. So my hat's off anytime I see an umpire doing a 12U to 14U tournament. It takes a lot of, you've got to be really committed to the game uh, and you've got to really be on top of your game and you've got to really understand the diplomacy associated with game management. So um, it really is the place where little league assumptions collide with high school regulations and um, look at it as game management heaven. <laughs> it's just a great place to practice that. Um, confidence is really delivered on every pitch during the game. And that's where we, what we talk about walking the walk. Um, there's an acronym that you could consider called SOLID. And the idea is that if you are S in the slot, and if you are O, can see the outside of the zone, L, locked in at delivery, if you can see the inside of the zone, and you've got decorum down in terms of your timing on your calls, the tempo of the game, on and off the field, in between innings, and the tone of your communications. If, you've, if you want to consider that, that's something that's really easy to remember, to self-evaluate during the game, after the game, before the game. But um, think of that as it relates to that 80% rule that I talked about earlier. In terms of floating the boat, making sure that that fundamental assumption about the accuracy of the time zone is the most important assumption and expectation that is met. Um, both coaches and players can do their jobs with confidence uh, if the zone is floating, if it's right, if it's accurate. Um, everything that the players and the coaches do to prepare for that game has everything to do with that supposition that the zone will be accurate and consistent. Confidence in your zone transfers to confidence in everything else that you do and your partner does for the duration of that game. So having a solid zone, again, stating the obvious, but here's a helpful acronym that really can break it down into five simple things that you can evaluate as you're moving through the game. If the zone is suspect, then that boat is, is going to start sinking and game management's going to get really, really difficult. It's going to be an uphill climb. Coaches and players, from their perspective anyway, can't meet the most basic expectations about pitch selection. Um, we, we know that coaches always tell, tell especially as, as, the, as the players get older, have an approach, have an approach. Well, that's, that's not just a phrase, that means something. It means that number one, when, when their batter is up, they have spent hours and hours and hours in batting cages trying to teach their players to number one, when they get up to the plate, the first mentality that they have is to hunt for a fastball. They want a straight fastball to hit. The second thing they want to do is if is they want to think about getting to a hitter's pitch on a 2-0 or a 3-1 count. The next thing that they want to think about in this approach is ignoring or fouling off off-speed pitches. Um, the other thing that they want to be that they're taught by their coaches in the batting cages is when they get to that two strike situation, they want to shorten the bat swing and they want to expand the zone and and really, really fight again, fight off off speed pitches until they can get that pitch that they want, which is, is a fastball in a good place. So when we think about an approach, it's really impossible to have an approach as a player if your umpire doesn't have can command of that strike zone and, and that that strike zone that he has doesn't resonate with all of the preparations that they've done to get those players ready to play baseball. So suspicion of your, of your, of your zone transfers to suspicion of everything else that you and your partner do that day. So again, I'm stating the obvious, but I'm trying to give you a little bit more color, a little bit more context, at least from the players or the coaches perspective about why it's just absolutely critical to not take the strike zone for granted, not look at it as trivial or simple. It's not, it takes a tremendous amount of focus and work on every single pitch. So many ejections 
can be traced to incremental strike zone frustration. Low zones tend to frustrate about 18 batters and they'll please two pitchers, but they will upset two coaches. And if you do the math, um, it, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, low zones are almost impossible to hit. We get it in the last 20 years or so, um, the low zone has been something that's been um, introduced. Uh, introduced is probably the wrong word. It's been supported. Um, but in recent years with, um, with Hawkeye and the advent of computer uh, visual technology to evaluate strike zone fidelity, um, it's, it's just not. And it, if, you're, if you're frustrating 18 batters, nine players on each team, um, you, you got a one-way ticket to game management. Heck, it's not a good place to be. So please, if, if you're if you've got a low zone, if you've gotten feedback that you do tend to call low strike or or pick up balls uh, that are low and pull them up into your strike zone, um, please please reconsider that and 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 uh, have at least have some conversations with some peers about it. Leaving pitches below the zone alone will. Uh, will please 18 batters. It will inform two pitchers and it will support two coaches. So again, leaving the balls down uh, where they belong makes, makes the ball easier to hit. It makes pitchers more precise and more uh, intelligent about their pitch selection is along with the catchers. And the coaches can support that behavior because that's where they've spent their time in the batting cages, giving that guidance and teaching their players time and time again how to have an approach when they're at the batting uh, at the plate. So let's talk a little bit about the solid zone. Um, let me go ahead and explain this. Hopefully you can see my cursor just a little bit. But uh, and I understand this is not to scale. So uh, really was focusing more on the width of the plate than the depth of the plate. But uh, wanted to go ahead and, and talk about. Let's just break it down. So we know that the zone, we know that the, the front of the plate is 17 inches wide. And we also know that by rule, a ball that touches any part of that zone, excuse me, a ball that touches any part of that plate is by definition a strike. We know that the baseball is about 2.94 inches wide. Let's just call it three inches wide to keep it uh, uh, simple. So if a ball traveling right next to the plate and glancing right next to it touches that plate, uh, it is a strike. So 17 inches plus three more inches is 20 inches wide at that point. If we jump over to the other side and a ball comes on the, on the inside of the plate for right-handed batter like it would here, uh, now it's three additional inches wide. So by definition, um, for Major League Baseball, NC2A, high school, Per the rule book, based on what we've just discussed, the width of that strike zone is actually 23 inches. That's almost two feet. And again, we talk about the 12U to the 14U baseball tournaments where players are, and coaches and parents are all learning to migrate and evolve from little league to high school. This is one of the most fundamental misnomers there are. And so um, you as the umpire having command of this is absolutely critical to diplomatically educating and supporting um, their evolution to, to higher level baseball is critical. Now, um, to take that conversation just a little bit further, um, according to uh, a book called by Matt Moore, Baseball's uh, Balls and Strikes, uh, a great book, by the way, it's not a big read. I call it 80, I don't know, 100 pages, if that, small book. But he talks and explains that in the Major League Baseball arena, a Major League Baseball umpire is given a two-inch buffer on each side of the zone. Again, remember the zone is 23 inches wide. So when they make a call on a pitch, they are not dinged if they miss it by less than two inches on either side. So if you want to look at it that way, the Major League Baseball acceptable zone is actually 27 inches wide. Now, as that relates to the river or the space between the batter's boxes, which are 29 inches apart, your major league acceptable zone is only an inch uh, more narrow than the, than the river is wide. <laughs> and that's, I've always found this to be just the fascinating part of the discussion about this strike zone. So I wanted to just, again, offer this for you to consider you can certainly, from a YouTube perspective, you can pause the video here and you can take a look at this and check these references. But I would 
I would I would really invite you to consider that um, this this is this is the strike zone from a width perspective, and this is documented. And the the more that you can get really really comfortable as an umpire calling your pitches in accordance with this, the better off you'll be. Um, I believe that the Major League Baseball acceptable zone is an awesome zone to have. Uh, you may not be, you may be calling high school games, you may not be in the major leagues, but giving yourself a two inch bu buffer and staying with a highly confident call is a great way to go. And in the baseball arena that we're in, especially with amateur baseball or uh, college level baseball even, um, having a zone that's consistent and accurate is critical as we talked about. And so it's for you to decide, certainly take what you want and leave what you don't. But at a minimum, it's important for us to make sure that we understand that that zone is 23 inches wide at a minimum and acceptably uh, 27 inches wide and getting really comfortable with seeing those pitches in that context is really, really important to demonstrating your competency and your confidence uh, at the plate. Uh, solid zone, let's talk about the vertical zone for just a second. So I, I've just, uh, I just found the umpires that seem to have the best command of the game seem to stay at the top of the belly button and the bottom of the knee. And they really require their pitchers to stick that pitch. Um, here's what I mean by that is if you look at NFHS rules, they will tell you, it, the book will tell you that halfway between the shoulders and the waistline is your midpoint. And that's the top of the zone. The NCA rule talks about a midpoint between the shoulders and the top pants in almost exactly the same language as the Major League Baseball rules do. So I think everyone would agree that this line right here on this batter, this midpoint, is kind of the universal top of the top of the zone from a vertical perspective. Uh, again, rule book talks about the sternum. Uh, it doesn't say sternum specifically. That's my language, but. Um, what, what it seems to say to me is at the front of the, at the front elbow or on the hands, or top of the letter. So to, again, if this is the top of the zone and the major league, and we're talking about M for major league, uh, major league pitch, if a ball touches the zone, i.e. this is an extreme situation, but if that pitch touches the top of the zone, look how high that pitch is now. It's at the top of the letters. And um, we'll talk about that in just a second. So from an acceptable perspective, in other words, helping and supporting where coaches coach their players and where we're trying to create a game that is extremely playable and, ex and moves very, very fluid. Um, uh, what I would recommend you consider is the, is the acceptable zone, which is below the front elbow and the hands or the bottom of the letters. So I, I kind of look at this as the NC2A zone. It's, it's, it's above the belly button, if the belly button's right here, but it's below that zone. In other words, not going above, I'm not going above that midpoint. Even if that ball is glancing on the top of that zone, I'm gonna stay below the hand, at the hands or below the hands and certainly below that front elbow. Um, as it relates to the bottom of the zone, uh, Federation rules talk about the bottom of the knees. So somewhere right in here, um, I use the word the letter N for National Federation and NCA because they're both pretty similar. Uh, NCA Rule 275 talks about the bottom of the kneecaps. Um, again, this is just a generalization, um, but Major League talks about the hollow of the kneecap. So, what the heck is the hollow of the kneecap? The patellar tendon is the hollow below the knee, and it can be two inches, approximately two inches below the patella. So if you, and again, for a taller fellow, it can be three inches. Uh, so my point here is that if you're going to go with a major league zone, you're going to, and you go with the principle that says that the ball touching any part of that zone is a strike. If the hollow of the knee is dropping two to three inches below the knee and a pitch glances to, to adjacent to that zone, you're now calling strikes. Um, that aren't too far above the shoelaces and certainly are very close to the middle of the shin. 
And again, we talked a little bit earlier about how difficult it is to manage a game if you're in the habit of pulling very, very low pitches up into the strike zone or calling that extremely low pitch. It may by it may be by rule, by rule, it may be a pitch in the majors. Um, and again, if you're doing men's league or if you're doing um, semi-pro, uh, that's your call. And you, you've got more education, I'm sure, than I do. I'm not going to speak to that. But I am speaking to the newer umpires. And what I would ask you to consider is really trying to stay from a vertical perspective in that NC2A, that that, Nash, that, uh, that high school zone, which really, really to me is the top of the belly button. Any pitch that's sitting on the top of the belly button or the bottom of the letters is good to go. And then anything that's, that's running across the kneecaps is good to go. Um, so anyway, I hope that's a little bit helpful. Uh, we talk a little bit about, you know, referencing the catcher's glove and the helmet and the knees. And when you go to school, there's just awesome instruction that shows you how to how those reference points work. Um, however, uh, what I would call out here is, you know, just to just to Socratically ask you what's wrong with this picture. Um, the, what's wrong with this picture is the batter is actually swinging the bat and we're evaluating the zone during the swing. And if you're familiar, obviously, with the rules, then you understand that you actually determine the batter's strike zone as he prepares to swing, not as he's swinging. When he starts to swing, he moves from having lateral shoulders in most cases to now having vertical or angled shoulders. And that starts to change the dynamic of the ball placement and the body placement quite a bit. So not trying to trick you too much, but just trying to illustrate that when you go ahead and look at a zone, um, it should be based on how that batter is when he's preparing to swing. What critical strike indicator is missing from this pitch? Uh, F2, F2, your catcher is so critical to completing the sentence about how a strike is to be called when you're managing a game. So let's go ahead and move forward to that. Uh, here you got a major league photo, which is uh, one of my favorites. And now we've got Ichiro getting, he's preparing to swing. And you could say, well, he started his swing, he's got his leg up, et cetera. And I'd say, well, um, let's cut me a little bit of slack here, but he is, it's definitely got the ball out here. He's preparing to swing. Um, this is the zone uh, that I would invite you to consider. So we got the top of the shoulders, we've got the midpoint, right? Top of the shoulders right up here which are right below the chin. We got the midpoint and we've got the top of the pants. Uh, we just, in the previous slide, talked a little bit about the three different zone, uh, zone specifications as it relates to that in high school, college, and, and the pros. And we've got the hollow of the knee. This is obviously a pro shot. So that's what, we're, what they've illustrated here. And so um, what I wanted to kind of, kind of, talk about here or illustrate now that we've got the correct picture or frame of reference which is a batter preparing to swing is the importance of the framing of the catcher as it relates to you the umpire understanding how to call that pitch and so what we've got is five pitches one two three four five and i've placed these quote unquote baseballs in the near or around this zone which is il illustrated right here with these orangish uh, lines. And then here, what I've done is just kind of drawn a straight line from the catcher's shoulder, which should, these, these are like Pac-Man circles, I apologize, not that creative, but this is basically the baseball glove. So the Pac-Man is the baseball glove. That's, that's where the catcher is going to extend their arm or his arm to go ahead and receive the pitch. And so I would ask you the question, you know, which, as you're looking at this, Again, keeping in mind the rule, the strike zone shall be determined from the batter's stance as the batter is prepared to swing at a pitch ball, Federation Rule 235. So when we look at these pitches, again, just for fun, just for grins here, um, and again, if this was interactive and we were in a class, we'd get lots of different opinions on this, which is where all the fun is, but um, I would ask you to kind of consider what's these five pitches. Keeping in mind that a little league zone is armpits to knees. The NCAA uh, high school zone is midpoint to knees and major league baseball is midpoint to hollow. So again, let's go ahead and look at this as, as, as let's, and let's talk about this in the context of high school 
umpiring because that's typically what this training is for is high school umpires. So um, as it relates to pitch number one, would you call that a strike? And these arrows right here, these white arrows are the continuation of the ball, obviously, to where it's received by the catcher. And again, we're assuming that the catcher is sticking his arm out there. He's going to give you a great look with an outstretched arm. He's going to stick it there for a half a second. So you get a clear view. He's going to have a lateral glove. And you're obviously, if you're in the slot, you've got uh, the solid components that we talked about in terms of an acronym already covered. You can see the outside of the zone, the inside of the zone with a clear view, no obstruction with the catcher. Um, again, I'm not going to comment on this umpire's position. The, really, the focus of this is really to understand where it's being received. So pitch number one, that's coming in. Let's say that's a hard slider and that hits the bottom of the zone. Uh, and, 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 and here's the front of the plate and here's that ball and it's clipping the bottom of the zone and it's gonna tail and cut and that catcher is gonna go ahead and uh, he's gonna catch it right, right there. So would you call that a strike? Again, these red lines right here, um, that's midpoint to kneecap. That is, the, that is the major league zone. So what would you do in that situation? Would you call that a strike if you receive it that low? Um, or would you, would you consider that a ball? Uh, the second pitch is this high pitch, this pitch coming in, number two. Here it is as it crosses the plate roughly, and it tails down. It's, a, it's another, let's call it a high curve coming in, and it breaks down, and it's right there. It's actually got most of that ball is on top of the midpoint of, of the batter. Uh, you're making a decision about what you're going to do in terms of calling that pitch. It's crossing here. High, it technically would be considered a strike if it touches any part of the zone, the top of the midpoint, or the midpoint is the top of the zone. So technically, that's look at look at where that pitch is. Look at where his elbow is. It's below the hands, but those hands are by the ears. So look at where that's going to be received. You got a catcher now with an, an extended arm that is extended upwards, and that's where he's going to catch it and he's going to stick it. All right, uh, pitch number three. Here it is, it's below the elbow, it's below the midpoint. Um, I'm gonna call that top of the belly button, to, on top of the belly button, lower numbers. Um, fairly straightforward, hopefully not too much discussion there. Um, pitch number four, uh, this is coming on right on the top of the pants, it, it looks like, and it's being received here. This blue line is what I would consider the high school zone or the NC2A zone. And again, you can argue and discuss and, and you can have multiple beer discussions on this topic. But really what I'm trying to illustrate here is these red lines are the major league zone. And this blue line right here kind of illustrates where a catcher would receive a ball in what I would consider a solid NC2A or high school zone that would align expectations and keep that boat floating very, very nice throughout a game. Uh, and then number five, this, this fifth pitch, it's coming across, the, it's, it's, it's splitting the hollow of the knee, if you will. So here's the bottom of the zone, half that ball is in it and half the ball's out of it, which means by definition, it's in the zone and it goes straight into the glove and it's received right here. So again, just think about it, have some conversations about it. Uh, I'm not gonna give you right or wrong because it's your zone. When you walk out there, we all know as umpires that you walk out there with your zone and the strike zone, is what you're going to adjudicate that day. And so um, you're gonna do your best to align it with the rules and manage the game, but um, it's really up to you. The one thing I would like to point out though about pitch number one is that this pitch has an arrow that's coming down. So it's a slider, it's an off speed, it's a change up, it's losing altitude, maybe not quite that fast, but it's an illustration, right? So my point is, that if that next pitch comes in and it's a fastball and it's received right here, if it's a fast straight ball, it's again, it's not totally straight. It's coming in at an angle to some degree, but if it's not a breaker and it's coming in and you call that a strike on, a, on an off speed, you're gonna have somebody who wants you to call that strike if it's not an off speed pitch. So where that, pit, where that catcher receives that pitch has so much to do with the call that you're going to make.
and the consistency that you're going to have. And again, we all know and believe that communicating with the, with the catcher is so critical to having an excellent game, helping that catcher understand where the zone is in a professional way helps everybody succeed and sets right expectations. So that's also very, very important. Um, so again, you can talk about reference points uh, in a lot of the, the, the uh, a lot of the workshops that you can go to and a lot of the clinics that you can go to, you'll get some good advice about, I'm going to, I'm going to frame this pitch based on where it's received uh, based on this catcher uh, and the way that they set up. There's, there's excellent in feedback and input you can get. I was at a, I was at a, a, a workshop um, locally here several years ago um, where a college umpire told me, shared a story about, how he went an entire game without watching a single pitch. And of course you hear something like that and go, well, what's the catch? And his point was that for that entire game, he simply watched the catcher's glove. In other words, his point of view wasn't out here at the pitcher. And again, it was one game and you can have another discussion about the pros and cons of that comment. But I found out, I felt found that from an instructional perspective, it illustrated the point that where that catcher receives the pitch has so much to do with the call of the strike or the ball. And so making sure that you marry the trajectory of that pitch with a reasonable strike zone, which I believe is this blue indication as it relates to where it's received, is just so, so critical. And as we know from a mechanics perspective that a good, um, uh, any umpire of any ability is trying to make sure they do not move their head when that pitch comes in and when it's caught. They are tracking it with their eyes. They're not moving their chin or their head at all for safety reasons and for, for effectiveness reasons. So my point here is try, you know, track that pitch all the way in to the glove. Track that pitch all the way into the glove. See it in the glove and then use good timing to make your call. But Again, where it's received is gonna set precedence throughout that game. That first inning, that, especially that first inning, maybe the second, but especially the first inning, you're gonna send a message to everybody in that ballpark about your capabilities and your competency and how well you're gonna be calling that game as it relates to where the pitch is received and where it crosses the plate as it relates to the, the, the regulated zone and the practical zone. And again, not trying to get everybody upset about the term practical zone, but I'd invite you just to consider the con the, the, con the, the concept. So um, that's that's what I wanted to cover there. Uh, solid zone stance. So um, warm up pitches always a couple. Again, these are now we're moving away from the strike zone a little bit. Here's some thoughts to consider as you as you you know as you work your craft to become a better umpire. But number one is, is make sure that when the game starts that you're set and that you're looking at incoming pitches before the game starts. And again, I'm speaking to the younger umpires or the newer umpires there. Uh, make sure that the first pitch you see is not the first pitch of the game. Um, that's incredibly important. It lets you stretch out, lets you see where the catcher's setting up, how you're gonna go ahead and stand, how you're gonna move into your slot um, in terms of your stance. Um, and each catcher is different. We all know that catchers come in all kinds of different uh, shapes and sizes, and that's awesome. But how they cover and how they set up, especially after they've given the sign, has everything to do with where you set up and how you run the slot. Um, there's a, a concept that's been introduced over the past several years called the super slot. It's this idea that as, as a catcher, as excuse me, as an umpire, that you're actually going to move, move up to the to the to the catcher's flank even more so that you've got a much clearer view of that outside pitch coming in and the stick that's coming in catchers these days are being taught so well they will receive that pitch laterally with the glove if that glove is eight to ten inches wide and you've only can see the glove um, trying to see how that ball enters the glove is important because if it, it's eight to ten inches wide and that ball comes in on one side of the glove versus the other, the left side or the right side, that may have something to do with how you're calling that pitch. And so, and how the catcher's presenting it is, they're, they're just incredibly well-trained. And, and so that super slot concept 
is, is becoming more and more important as the catchers become more and more effective at framing pitches. Uh, other things that I wanted to go ahead and talk a little bit about are a lot of the a lot of the catchers, especially as they advance into the higher ages and the higher skill sets, they're being taught by catching coaches to actually receive the ball way back here instead of out front. Uh, and um, there are reasons for that. Uh, catchers know that it's easier for us to make a call if they stick that pitch with an extended arm and give us a good, good look at it. They're also learning that if they step back here a little bit on a questionable pitch, they may get the benefit of a strike on that call because we don't may not have that frame of reference if they've got their glove all the way back to their chest when they receive it. So again, another argument for the, or at least something to consider for the super slot in terms of moving yourself up and having, um, having that, that, foot, that foot all the way up uh, parallel to the catcher's feet on the left side if you've got a right-handed batter. Uh, that's what I wanted to cover there. Again, I would encourage you to have conversations with your peers and in your associations about these concepts uh, and see where you stand, see where the, every association has their, their veterans that everyone respects and learns from. And uh, these are great, these are great concepts uh, to run by them because uh, they've got great stories and reasons why they do what they do and why they recommend what they do. So uh, again, I would just respectfully ask you to, to take this to your association or to your mentors um, and when you go to go to your pro school or your NC2A school and even your, your high school master clinics, um, bring up the concept of the super slot and see what type of feedback you get. And then, again, when you find your own voice as an umpire through enough experience and enough education, um, you'll kind of know what you want to do. Uh, and from a mechanics perspective, again, we've talked, these are, this is review, this should be review for everyone. Um, if it's not, uh, that's okay. Let's let's go ahead and, and chat about it for just a few minutes. Uh, number one, you're always trying to track your pitches with the eyes. You're always going to follow the ball all the way into the catcher's glove without moving your head. Never follow a pitch with your chin. Ever do that. Never, ever, ever do that. You can get a glanced ball right into your skull. Um, if you're not using a hockey mask, that can easily turn into a situation where you can take a ball to the temple. Uh, the injuries can be awful. So again, from a mechanics perspective, practice always tracking pitches with your eyes. Again, that's another reason why that super slot stance is becoming more popular. Um, as far as being athletic goes, <laughs> the, all I'm trying to convey there is that when you're at the plate, if you're, if you're not, um, if, if you haven't illustrated that you're mobile, um, that can create some game management situations. Um, you don't want to just stand there and bend from the waist. Um, you want to avoid resting on the knees. And I get you got a four game set in a tournament uh, and you're tired. It's 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 your second uh, it's your second doubleheader of the weekend. They're all I mean, you get tired. I get it. These are just things for you to consider. But as much as possible, bend from Bend at the knees in a squat to get down and locked into your position. If you're in a situation where you're conserving your motions, in other words, you're not really active back there, you're, you're very calm, you're very um, composed, um, the best umpires that I watch, um, they don't move a lot behind the plate. They have a place, they have their set position, they try to keep their motions as minimal and as brief as possible. They're always prepared. Um, for the, for the next activity, and they've always got their eye on where the ball is. But uh, I would just, again, encourage you to consider that. I know there's some practical considerations, especially on, as you're a younger umpire, you're doing a lot of games and getting tired on a Sunday, on a Sunday after doing a four or five game set. I, I get that you get exhausted, but try to squat instead of bend, squat at the knees down when you're getting locked in instead of uh, bending at the knees. One of the big things that I really, it's a little thing, but it's a big thing, is that as a younger umpire or a newer umpire, and, and even as a tired umpire, sometimes you can get this habit, not even knowing it, of glancing, um, uh, of bringing your, your indicator up to your face to check the count. And it's, it's just a big, big signal that says you are a new umpire 
and you're doing it for the money or you're not well trained, uh, it says a lot of things and none of them are positive. So what, what we really recommend is that you keep that indicator in your left hand, of course, and that you've always got, you never bring an indicator above your belt. So you've got it down next to your side. Uh, again, you're using your eyes, not your chin. So all you're doing is, is if you need to check the count, you got the indicator in your left hand, you're just gonna bring your hand out a little bit from your waist. You're gonna glance down with your eyes and you're gonna check the count and then you're gonna get back to it. But please, if, if I could say anything here that makes a big difference in terms of the, uh, the optics and how you're perceived as an umpire and, and all kinds of assumptions that people make about your experience, do everything you can to number one, always have the indicator in your left hand. Number two, never bring the indicator above your belt. Um, just cup the hand and glance down with your eyes. And if you're really good at it, you won't move your chin. You'll just track down to the indicator the way you would track down for an incoming ball. Uh, for those of you who may have uh, be frustrated with the size of some of those uh, uh, indicator uh, indicators, um, the, the numbers are, are not very big, but there are Japanese indicators um, that you can purchase that are awesome. They have large displays. They have white backgrounds on black numbers. They're very, very easy to see. Uh, so I would really, another plug, uh, if you will, for a product that can make your life easier. But Japanese indicators are, um, are extremely easy to use and easy to see. Uh, verbalize the count. Again, I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Um, you're going to go to schools. You've got mentors. Um, there are some standard, there's some standard guidance. Um, one of those is that you never start, you never start, never is a, a bad word to use. I apologize. But in most cases, you don't want to start calling the count. So you've got two of something, two balls or two strikes. Um, however, back to the word never, never say the words full count just say three balls, two strikes, and only signal to the pitcher. Do not signal to dugouts. Again, younger umpires, uh, you're doing JV games, you're doing C-squad freshman games, or you're doing you know, tournament games for the, the 14U, 15U group. Just, just get in the habit now of doing what you're gonna do when you are a uh, varsity high school umpire or a college collegiate umpire or a pro umpire someday. Do just get those habits down now. And, and some of those important habits are, are making sure you only verbalize uh, certain things and that you don't, you don't become a concierge umpire. Don't be that umpire that's giving, that's flashing the, the, the count to both dugouts. Don't be that guy because you're going to make it. If you set that standard, uh, which is a very low standard uh, during a game and you've got a double header, uh, when your partner goes back to do the plate uh, and does it the right way, um, that's the right thing for him to, to do. But you, you're going to set an expectation with those folks, and they're going to, if they, if you haven't set the correct expectation with them, they're going to expect that umpire to actually not do the right thing. So please uh, consider that. Uh, it, it's, it's a really big deal. The other thing is, as a younger umpire. Uh, you may um, have a tendency for whatever reason to listen to coaches. Let's say you're a very hospitable umpire and you're there because you love the kids and, and you love the game and you don't have big aspirations and you just want to make everybody happy. And so you've got those coaches that, that were little league coaches that haven't been evolving very well as they've gotten to the lower high school ranks and any call that you they, they don't like that you've made, they want you to get help on because they don't agree with it. You go down that path, you're in big trouble. Keep in mind the places where you are to get help are very, very specific, okay? And so um, uh, just, just be very, very clear on that. You've got a, you've got a ball check swing um, and you've got a pulled foot at first base. Those are the two places where you are required to get help. Uh, if you are asked to get help. But other places, is there good judgment? Sure, there's good judgment. If you are in a place where you don't have the right angle, and if you don't have the right distance, and you are in a varsity level or a collegiate level game, and that coach will know that you don't have the right distance or the right uh, dis uh, angle for that call, that's a good time 
to go ahead and be accountable for the fact that for whatever reason, you didn't have the vantage that you wanted or should have had, that's a good place to go ahead and consider getting help. But if you are in the right place with the right angle and the right distance and you make that call, then you stick with that call. And when they say, when one, of, when the, when one coach says, can you get help? You say, no, I made the right call, right place, right distance, right angle. We're moving on coach. Um, so again, some things for you to consider. The catcher's tells, if you're, a, if you're a solid, in other words, we've talked a little bit about what the solid acronym stands for, and you lose sight of the catcher's glove at the catch, if it's gone from your field of view, then, it, then, it, then generally speaking, that's a ball. Again, I'm assuming that you are in the slot, that you or a super slot. <coughs> I'm assuming that you're solid. So super slot or slot, you can see the outside of the zone. You can see the inside of the zone. You're locked in at delivery and you've got the right disposition and demeanor in terms of the tone and the timing of your calls. Generally speaking, if you lose sight of an incoming pitch, and if you, excuse me, if you lose sight of the catcher's glove when he receives it, that's a ball, generally speaking. If the catcher receives the pitch with the palm up, that's a ball. Again, you can have these discussions in your associations, but generally speaking, if you can make these things a habit, you're gonna have very good game management experiences. You're gonna set reasonable expectations with coaches and players, and they will do the right thing. A stick is a receipt via an extended arm or a still wrist with a clear view of the glove. No movement after contact. It's just a flash. Uh, it's, it's a freeze frame. It's a freeze frame, if you will, that, that the catcher gives you. And if you can see that glove and it is, it is where it needs to be for that pitch, um, it's often a strike. And we call that a stick. And it's, it's again, everyone's got their own style, but I will... I will sometimes tell the catch, nice stick, appreciate that. And, and again, that builds that can build rapport with the catchers. A frame, I just think, again, you guys can argue all day long and discuss all day long the difference or non-difference between the stick and a frame, but I tend to look at a frame as a presentation of the glove after a pitch is received. And if movement happens after contact, in other words, that wrist is, is moving or that arm moves at all, I call that a reposition. And in my mind, the only reason a catcher is going to reposition an incoming pitch is if he wants to move it to a place where it should be that it's not. And so in most cases, or generally speaking, that's a ball. Nomenclature says um, how new you are. So again, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but a foul is a good thing to say. Foul ball is not such a good thing to say. Time is a good thing to say. Time out is not such a good thing to say. Um, lateral cues for a catcher only um, are, are also something that, that can also be very valuable in managing a game situation, uh, i.e. things like uh, catch that's in, catch that's out, if they ask, um, especially in those early innings when you're setting the precedence that you'll need to rely on through the rest of the game. So anyway, I hope that makes a little bit of sense. Solid zone mindset illustrated by little things. So again, uh, for you new umpires or mid-range umpires uh, who haven't fully got your voice yet, I'm, I'm hopeful these things help a little bit. Most of what I'm sharing here are things that I've, I've that have been shared with me by my mentors and by the, the folks that I learned through learn from at school. So uh, again, tone, take them for what they're worth or not worth. But what I've learned is the following. Tone is your job as the umpire. It's a component of decorum. It's up to you to set the tone. It's not up to a coach that likes to be really loud or has a reputation. It's not up to a batter that has a, a, an extended process for uh, getting up to the plate and getting ready every single time. It's not for a pitcher who has a ritual that takes almost 20 seconds when they, I, I hope you're getting the message. The tone is your job. It is not up to anybody else except you and your partner. Tempo is your job. Slow baseball is painful baseball. It doesn't matter how much you love this game. If the ball game is going slow, it hurts. And it will contribute negatively to game management scenarios. So 
please count the war. If you're the plate umpire, count the warm up pitches on either line. So uh, make sure you're out there and you're seen. Make sure that you know that the tempo is your responsibility. Perspective is your job. Uh, again, lots of great baseball out there. We get in these games. Um, and sportsmanship and character are the reason for this game. But that's a little bit of a naive statement. I totally get it. In some of these big games, you've got a lot of players and coaches that have worked very hard to get where they're at. They're at a different level, and they are trying to illustrate that, and they are trying to master their craft because they have a right to a bigger future of baseball. Get it, get it, get it. Um, however, at the end of the day, it is a baseball game. and the perspective that you're able to offer through your decorum to coaches and players through your tone and your tempo is critical. If it starts to be more than a game, if it starts to be more important uh, than anything else, uh, if you start to feel yourself believing that this game is, is the end all be all, then check yourself because you're there uh, to offer a perspective that everyone is going to feed off of. One of the phrases that I've used in the past when I've got a, a situation where a parent or a coach is starting to, to move in a direction that may be not healthy for that game is I'll just say, listen, we're not, we're not in Afghanistan today, thank God. We're here playing a baseball game and it isn't a beautiful thing. Let's go ahead and play baseball, shall we? And, and that, again, I'm not saying that's your, your line or your way of approaching it, but that's a way that I, living here in Colorado, near Colorado Springs, uh, in a very, um, you know, in a place where uh, respect uh, for the armed forces is, is very, very common, um, that, that's, a, that's a message that I can share with folks to try to bring perspective back to where we're at and let us continue to, to play the game in a way that we're all proud of. Um, the, the strike zone is your strike zone. Uh, when you bring it to the game, it's yours. And so, uh, I, and I know to some that may say, that may have sounded like I'm staying the obvious, but it's so important from a conviction perspective that you believe in your zone. You cannot be asking yourself if something is a strike or a zone when you get there. You have to know what your strikes look like. You have to know what your balls look like. You have to know how your zone is constructed. And you got to make that call with conviction. And if you're in a situation as you move up in the ranks uh, in, your, in your umpiring career, it is absolutely critical that you move with that level of conviction with your strike zone. I'm not saying that your strike zone is right or wrong. I'm not saying there aren't some things that you can work on. God, we can all work on that low outside uh, fastball or slider on the edge of the plate. We can all work on that. We will always work on that. Uh, Major League umpire, umpires miss 11% of the pitches during a given game. Um, my understanding is there's only two that have achieved single game 99% accuracy. Um, and one is Mr. West, for those of you who may or may not be uh, fans of Mr. West, but he's one of them. He's that good. So, um, and he's here, he's been that good. But uh, I, I just want to call out that you've, you've got to believe in your zone and um, it, it's just critical to your tone and your tenor. Never, never entertain, just officiate. Uh, I won't go into that too much, but it, it, as you move from officiating little league games to high school games, um, there are some umpires out there who tend to want to uh, for whatever reason, uh, you know, have some jokes and have some laughs. And I, I would suggest respectfully that that's, if that's going to be left anywhere, it just has to be left at the little league level. And you can say, well, it shouldn't be there. And I would say, well, at that level, it's a game and you should be having a lot of fun and it should just be a blast. It should just, little league baseball should be a ton of fun and umpires that people feel you know, comfortable around and appreciate and have a sense of humor and are approachable. Those are those are awesome traits. Uh, however, as you start to move up and you get into those situations where you've, you've got a higher level of skill and a lot higher expectations, um, got to kind of leave that behind is, is the, what I would offer to you. And it, it's a way of making sure that you stay away from game management uh, margins or peril 
And it's a way to make sure that you respect your partner as well, because your partner is out there, especially as you move up to the high school, college ranks, they're there to do a job. They're where to do it. They're there to do it the best they've ever done it every time they do it. And um, that type of respect is critical. Every pitch is a strike. This is something that's been, over the, over the last couple of years, this has come into a discussion point, which is fine, but it's been taught in pro school and uh, college schools, NC2A schools for several, several years. The idea here is that every pitch um, before it releases, before it, before it leaves the hand of the pitcher is a strike. And it has to prove otherwise. Uh, again, old school, yes. Um, is it coming into some criticism? Sure it is, that's good. This type of debate is great for the game. But uh, I have found it to be incredibly valuable to me in helping me find my own umpire voice. And I've found it to be very valuable in the mentors and the umpires that I watch and that I, I, I follow and try to be like. Uh, it's If you know in your mind that this is a strike until it proves otherwise, your brain is looking for a way to disprove. It's looking for one indicator that tells it that it is not a strike. If you take a mental approach that the pitch could be a ball or a strike, then your brain is asking the question, which is it? If you take every pitch as a strike before it's thrown, your brain is simply trying to say, is it not? Those two mental processes are different. And one, in my opinion, is much more simple to administrate than the other. And I'll just leave it at that. Uh, identify and address behavioral issues before the second inning ends. Uh, again, from a game management perspective, um, you, you want to be communicating to the coaches in person and proximity. Uh, you know, we, we watch a lot of YouTube films and we see a lot of umpires on these films that are yelling to the dugout, et cetera. I'm not here to criticize them at all, at all. All I'm suggesting is to you as a young umpire that if you can in those formative years, make it a habit to as much as possible to not yell back at someone when they're yelling out at you and just kind of have the composure at the right time to go talk to them in proximity, not suggesting that you're destroying the tempo of the game. I'm not suggesting you do it in the middle of an inning. I'm just suggesting at the right time, have a conversation and try to demonstrate that the conversations you're going to have with coaches are going to be in proximity. And in a COVID world, that's more than six feet at this point in time. But um, I think you know what I'm saying. It shows respect. It shows that you have perspective. It shows that you have the disposition to, and the maturity to set the right tone um, for those conversations. And it indicates to the coach, that, that both coaches, that if they want to talk to you, they're welcome to come uh, approach you and that you'll talk to them in proximity and that you're really not interested in a yelling situation. You want to communicate with the pitcher via the catcher calmly and positively. Um, I'd really encourage you not to communicate with pitchers. And, and again, you're, you're walking out, you know, home runs hit, you walk out, you give them a ball and you turn around and go back to the plate. Um, I get that there are different situations. Those of you who are veteran umpires, they all, everybody knows that. What I'm trying to say as a guiding principle is that when you're doing a game behind the plate, if you have something to say, to a pitcher in any way, shape, or form. Number one, it should go to the coach if you've got to say it first. And if you're going to say something, say it to the catcher. So an example of that might be uh, early in the game, you know, a pitcher tries out a new set position and he's really, really quick uh, with that release. And, you know, mentioning to the catcher just underneath your mask, hey, catcher, I need your pitcher to come set. Something like that. And again, you do it for both sides. And, um, but it's, it's a way to convey information that positively affects the game. It's not unfair. Um, in my opinion, it's not unfair. And you could argue, wait a second, at certain levels, they have to know that. And you're right, at certain levels, they do. But if you are doing uh, high school games um, and you're in a situation where there are some developing pitchers coming up and it's a, it's, it's not a league game, it's a non it's, it's just a, maybe it's a tournament game or it's a traveling game. You make the call, but what I'm really trying to say is don't talk to the pitcher. If you're gonna say anything, say it to the coach or say it to the catcher 
and just be very constructive and very discreet. Uh, third thing, escalations don't need to escalate emotionally. So really the message here is just because a situation is getting worse doesn't mean you need to emotionally elevate. Uh, in fact, you want to probably move in the opposite direction. Is that stating the obvious? Yes, it is. Is it hard to do? Yes, it's very hard to do. But I just want to state for the record that just because a coach may be in a situation that they're getting upset or a player is getting upset, uh, whatever, or, or a fan, whatever it is, your emotions can be, remain completely calm. Your heart rate can remain completely calm. It takes some work, but you can do it. And it, that high bar is something that's worth trying to achieve uh, because it will demonstrate that you are well beyond your years in your uh, umpiring IQ. Remember, time is granted. Again, this is for the newer umpires or you know some of the mid-range umpires who may you're just looking for a review, but Time is never demanded, it is granted after it is requested and after you determine the play is over. Don't get wrapped around the axle on this. You know, coach says, hey, Blue, time. You know, that's, that's their way of asking. You get it, you can read the body language. We've got good demeanor, you got, you got a good feeling on the field. Uh, but some, when you've got a situation where, where coaches start to believe that they're in charge of the game, um, it's, it's important that you and your partner or partners uh, consistently demonstrate that time is to be granted. And that's not an ego thing. It's a technical regulatory safety thing. You have to be sure that the play is over and that it is sufficiently over uh, for you to, uh, to grant time and allow something else to take place. You are only required to ask a partner for help on a check swing ball or pulled foot. We've already talked about that. And you're extremely smart if you get help, if you make a call with a compromised angle or distance. So again, I, boy, I would really encourage you to consider that. Develop a zone that coaches and players recognize and respect. You're not creating a zone for them, but you are creating your zone that to be recognized and relied on by them. Big, big, big deal. Um, if you create a zone, that is extremely different. Even though it's technically correct, you will have a very diff difficult situation, and especially if you're doing it in the amateur levels, the high school levels, and, and some of the college you know, club games and, and men's league type games, semi-pro games that are not being recorded. If you don't have a Hawkeye on your zone or an instant replay, um, it's really important that, that your performance at the plate is extremely acceptable. And I use that word intentionally. So in this training, I've talked a little bit about the regulate the rule book zone, and I've talked about the acceptable zone. And so what, what I would encourage you to consider as you find your own zone and your own voice behind the plate is that nothing too high and nothing too low is an acceptable way to approach it. And if you want to reference back to the previous slides to get a better understanding of that, please do. However, um, uh, it's on the, on, the, on the, not however, but on the horizontal side, I would say that the major league zone is the max and nothing more. Uh, so what I mean by that is we talked a little bit about the, the, the width of the 27 inch wide major league zone when you, as you start to move up, those, those games where you start to move from, let's say uh, a JV or a C squad game or 15U up to, you start to get those 17U games and you start to move up into those varsity games, you're gonna start to see pitchers that are extremely good. And you're gonna start to see catchers that are extremely good. And they are going to try and move you to where they want those those strikes to be called that are actually balls. They're gonna to try to move you outside of that 27 inch zone. Um, and it's very, very important that you draw a machino line as it relates to that major league zone, if that's what you're gonna call. If you're gonna call the, the NC2A, if, you, if you're gonna call the, the, 23, the 23 inch zone without the two inch buffer, um, awesome, that's great. But the main thing I would encourage you to understand is if, if as you rise in the ranks, you're going to come across pitches because of awesome receiving and pitching, 
that at, at times will move you out of that 20, um, a 23 inch zone. And that's why that two inch buffer is really important. You're not at the major leagues. You're not watching an 89 mile an hour cutter. You're not watching a 97 mile an hour fastball. You're not, you're not, you're not seeing that stuff that they get paid so much money to and, and spend so much time watching. Um, you are in your own evolution. And during that evolution, it's really important in your own mind that you're not allowing, as you're moving up, pitchers to, to, and catchers to move you outside of an acceptable zone. Don't beat yourself up when you make a mistake. Just please, um, just please be aware that your zone is your zone and that's the way it's gonna be for that game. On a three, two count, this is where you really wanna be inside the head of the coaches. Um, and again, you're anticipating, but you're not deciding. You want to be aware of what's possible or likely to happen. The more you get into reps and cycles, especially at a higher level, when you're doing a lot of varsity high-end games, if you're starting to do college level stuff, um, you're, you're going to start to see patterns that are just inspiring. You're going to see skills that amaze. And you're going to see that your responsibility as umpire is much more than you may have imagined. So what I mean by that is have an understanding of the psyche of the coaches in certain situations, especially on a three-two count. So what is a head, what, what is what is a hitter's perspective on a full on, on a on a three-two count? There, I almost said it. Can you believe it? So on a three-two count, um, the hitter is up there, and what that hitter is thinking most likely is I'm going to shorten this bat, which means I'm going to move my hands two inches up on the bat to make it easier for me to control. I'm going to expand that zone. A close pitch is going to be a pitch I'm going to go after versus I'm not going to be picky. Excuse me, my picky zone is out the window on a 3-2 count. So I've shortened the bat. I've choked up on the bat. I'm going to look at pitches that are close and they are in play and, and they, are, they are what I'm going to go after. I'm going to try to foul off my off-speed pitches and so I can wear down the pitcher and get the pitch I want. I'm going to foul off marginal pitchers that I pitches that I might have let go before. And I'm going to go oppo with an outside fastball. So if you as the umpire know that that's probably the way the hitter's looking at this situation, you're in a much better position to call that pitch. You understand the dynamics. You understand what people are trying to accomplish. You're not putting yourself in a trap. You're not saying this is absolutely what they're thinking, but you're in a position where you can anticipate and understand. And if that's the situation, you can adapt it to what that pitcher has to offer. If you've got a pitcher that's got an unhittable slider, uh, you got, you know, it's, you just got to be aware of that. If you've got a, uh, a pitcher that's got a sidewinder release with a ball that elevates and tends to tail on a two or a four seam throw up or out and, and, and it's a three, two count, you, you want to be anticipating the outside of that corner. Um, you want to be anticipating somebody who has a hard fastball to maybe come in inside before they set up that outside pitch or vice versa. But thinking about what the coaches have probably instructed the players to do from a hitting perspective only elevates your IQ. From a pitcher's perspective on a 3-2 count, they're trying to throw a ground ball. Um, ground balls are typically lower pitches. Um, they want the benefit of a low pitch strike. And that's where you've you got to toe the line based on how you arrive at your own philosophy with your zone and how you look at game management philosophy as well. Um, they, uh, the pitchers are not too high on the heater. In other words, they're not going to, they're not going to, they're not going to throw a fastball down the middle to end the inning or end the, end the, end the count. That's, that's suicide as it relates to the higher level play. Um, so they want to throw a ground ball and they, they want to keep it low. They want to keep it on the, on the edges. And if they can get to the corner before the batter can catch up to them, they're going to do that all day long. And you can anticipate that. So again, baseball's full of surprises. These are guiding principles, but again, try to think about what the hitters are thinking and pitch and how the pitchers are thinking based on what the coaches are probably asking them to do and how they coach them. Call the pitch you see. Never balance the ledger. Again, there's the never word, but this is appropriate. Um, if you if you have a, a pitch come in, and you know if somebody 
is some if you're doing a, a, a high school a, 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 high, a very good high school game if you're doing uh, anything on the high club level during the summer and you've got a pitcher that's been with you for four innings and for the first time in the fourth inning they take out a slider that you haven't seen and the catcher hasn't told you anything about and it cuts seven inches in the last 10 feet right across the plate and you're stuck we've all been there We've all had deer in the headlights, it happened. Um, and you call it a ball because you're surprised or shocked or whatever the reason is. Um, the next move is not to, 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 to balance the ledger. It's not to call a ball a strike. That is, do not do that. Please don't do that. That will create game management situations. You're gonna hear some coaches say, well, you owe me one. All right, Blue, that's all right. We're good friends, but uh, I'm gonna collect that one later. You don't go there. Please don't go there. Please, don't. for your partner's sake and for your sake, don't go there. The best thing you can do is don't make that mistake again. But please don't balance the ledger because you will then not, if, if, if you miss a call, you've got one coach who's not too excited, especially if you miss it at a time and a place in a game that really, really, really matters. Uh, the worst thing you can do is make the other coach mad at you too by doubling up on your mistakes. So um, the last thing is that as you get old, as you get more experienced, you've got to reach this place in your umpiring career where you got to decide what you're going to do with the catcher zone. And what I mean by that is um, throughout baseball history, is my understanding, and every every umpire's life that goes through this and does a a fair amount of games, spends a certain number of years umpiring, you're going to create a rapport with the catchers. You're going to umpire long enough to where people will get to know you. They'll know your zone. They'll appreciate that you're going, that you're there. They trust you. Um, you may you may have common friends uh, in terms of their parents or the coaches. Um, the baseball world can get kind of small if you stay in it long enough. It really can. And so what that means is that because you've got this rapport with the catcher when they're catching and, and you're communicating and you're you're, you, you, there's just a, it's just a different relationship. You're, you have an understanding for the most part that, that is designed to help the game move along and to help that catcher succeed and help that. And what I mean by that is help the catcher understand what you're doing. And again, I'm not going to take that to the nth degree. You're not, you're not talking to the catcher on every pitch, but you're going to have a relationship with the catchers. You may talk to them as during warmups, et cetera, et cetera. I hope, I hope you know what I mean. It's, and so what you don't want to do when the catcher gets up to bat is tighten the zone for them and give them the benefit of a doubt on a close pitch. If you've got one zone, that's the zone you call. And if the catcher knows your zone and that's the zone you call, you are in great shape. But if you start to feel like because you've got a good relationship with this catcher or that catcher and uh, that, you know, that you're going to give them the benefit of a doubt on a close pitch. In other words, every pitch is a strike until it proves it's a ball. Somebody's hitting that outside corner during the game, and, and it is as far out as you're going to go, but it's there. You're not going to decide when the catcher's up to bat that all of a sudden that's a ball. So I don't want to spend more time on this. I'm just going to say that if you haven't reached that time in your career yet, you do need to make a decision about what you're going to do. And, um, and, the recommendation, obviously, is that you just have one zone and that you respect the catchers enough to let them have the same zone that everybody else does. It's a sign of great respect. And again, if anybody knows your zone, it should be the catcher. So when they're up to bat, if anybody should know what you're going to do, it's it, it's it's them. You don't want to change your mind at all. And uh, so I'll leave it there. Uh, the last thing I wanted to offer is some observations and perceptions. Uh, and again, take these and throw them away if you don't like them or consider them or discuss them. But uh, our, the, the picture to your left here is um, <laughs> is taken from a television monitor. And uh, if you look at that zone carefully, uh, the top of this zone is almost is right at the belt buckle. It, and you could argue it's actually a little below the belt buckle. And the bottom of this zone is, is definitely there at the bottom of the hollow of the knee. So one of the things that TV does, that Hawkeye, old Hawkeye, some of the better Hawkeyes are, they're just so much better than this one. So I, I chose this one because it illustrates how badly 
uh, TV can set bad perceptions for 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 uh, fans, for parents, for players, and for coaches. If they're watching a baseball game before they come to play a baseball game that you're going to umpire, and this is the zone that they've been looking at, um, that is that is not the right precedent that you want coming in that game from people who are going to watch you be an umpire. So um, I just threw that out there. I, I wanted to let you know there is some there is some empathy coming to you as it relates to how we may indirectly be set up for failure by the media. Uh, but I want to let you know that empathy, that, that empathy is just going to come from umpires. <laughs> it's not going to come from uh, other folks, I don't think. Anyway, one man's opinion. Uh, strike zone accountability. Call the high strike or retire. Um, Major League Baseball 24-hour report cards accumulate over a season. Uh, so again, if you didn't know, if you're a Major League umpire, you get a report the morning after every game that you do, and you get an assessment or report card that tells you whether you were good or bad at calling strikes and balls. And it's decided by a computer called Hawkeye. And that technology determines whether you keep your job or you don't. It determines whether you move up or down in your seniority. Uh, Major League umpiring now, if you haven't been able to tell, is completely driven by statistical merit. It is how well you conform with the rules. It is not the, the, the old days of nothing, never calling a pitch above the, the belt. Those are gone. In fact, they will hurt you if you hold on to those. Um, and again, the reason I say that is, isn't because you're being watched on camera um, doing a high school game or, or a, 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 a summer league tournament or what have you. It, it's because people are going to bring those expectations to you. And you've, if you hit those expectations, you're going to have a pretty good game. So as it relates to the high strike, I consider the high strike to be a ball that's, that's sitting on top of the belly button and below the sternum. Um, again, you can consider it what you like, but if you don't call the high strike um, at some point, you're probably going to, you're going to, and you keep it, you keep wanting to unprime more games. If you fail to call the high strike, you'll probably run into a situation where you won't get asked back because people are starting, not starting, but, especially at the collegiate level, people understand, coaches and umpires understand, you call the high strike. That's just what you do. And they need to be prepared for it. They need to coach in accordance with that. Strike zone for riders, uh, righties rather. If you didn't know this, it's expanded uh, inside over, over the recent past, call it the last 10 years or so. Um, but the strike zone, statistically speaking, has, is, is, is expanded on the inside uh, as it relates to inside pitches for righties. And what that means is, is the, from what my assessment of, of the data that's been released, is that that's a good thing. Uh, in the past, um, inside strikes on righties were not being called, but the advent of Hawkeye has, has really changed that. So um, calling the inside strike is becoming more and more common. And if you want to be ahead of the curve a little bit, um, be, you can be aggressive there, and that's okay. Strike zone for lefties, is, is, yeah, this is the opposite story for them. Expanded outside on the outside of the plate over the recent past. And statistically speaking, that's not a good thing because the more strikes that have been called on the outside for lefties have actually been less accurate instead of more accurate. So um, that's just a, a note to self as an umpire is, is don't, let, don't let that pitcher and that catcher you know, persuade you to move out uh, outside heavily uh, on those on those lefties. Major League strikes and balls in 2019. On average, uh, Major League umpire missed 14 pitches per game or 1.6 per inning. So on those days where for whatever reason you're umpiring, maybe you're exhausted, you've umpired all weekend, you've got a four or five game set on a Sunday after you did four games on a Saturday and you just kind of hit the wall. Um, don't don't beat yourself up. I mean, it's it's OK. It's OK to miss a pitch. The best people, the best umpires in the world do it almost every single game about 14 times. Major League Baseball's toughest call uh, says that thing to do with home plate. This is just an FYI. But statistically speaking, the most difficult call for an umpire to make is the banger at first base. Um, the data that I read said that um, for a two year period, I believe it was 2015, 16. Don't hold me to that. My point, though, is that uh, bangers at first in the major leagues that were challenged 
were, turn, were overturned 49% of the time. So if, 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 if base umpires, again, they got multiple umpires, right? You got six umpires in a major league baseball game, minimum four. And you got one umpire at first, that's their job. And, um, and roughly half the time, a close call is challenged. It's overturned based on Hawkeye and based on, you know, the photography today that has a million, uh, a million snaps per second. So um, I would say, you know, consider that and be really, really humble and focused about your assignment when you're in, and when you're in position A out there. Um, it's, it's a tough call, especially when you're in B. If you're running a two-man system at a high school or a college game and you're turning over to first after making that call at second on a double play, um, being locked in is extremely important. And um, so anyway, I'd something to consider. It's just uh, that people talk about baseball and what's difficult and what's easy, et cetera, what's the hardest play, uh, et cetera. <clears throat> we all know from a two-man system, the two blind spots on a baseball field are behind second and behind third. Even if you got distance and angle right, those can be really tough to see. Uh, and so, but the, the most important play to get right, arguably, as it relates to risk and liability, is the banger at first. So make sure your mechanics, your distance, your angle is as solid as it can be when you're in a position to make that call. Minor league ladder to join the major leagues. Based on the schools I've gone to, it's about 17 years. Um, starts with five-day camps, goes to five-week schools. Be fit, tall, and young <laughs> is what I would tell you. Um, flawed television, strike zones. We just talked about that earlier. Uh, umpiring is really difficult to do well. Uh, so do it because you love it. Enjoy getting better. Be committed to getting better. Um, one of the best pieces of umpiring advice that I've, I've appreciated the most is, number one, find your own voice. Go to pro school. Go to NC2A school. Find your own voice. At some point, um, at some point, get all the feedback and the mentoring in the early years that you can as you're looking at it. But when you really commit to this as something you want to do long term, go find your own voice at pro school. Um, number two, find great mentors. Um, doesn't mean they're going to change your voice once you've got it, but they will give you color and context and perspective that is invaluable as you grow as an umpire. And I would and learn from every partner and improve at something each game. So. If you do 200 games in, in a summer season um, and before every game starts, you review, you review solid if you're at the plate, S-O-L-I-D, the acronym. But if you choose one thing that you're going to improve on, whether it's if you're at the plate, maybe it's you're going to improve on timing plays. Maybe you're going to make sure you stay at the point of the plate um, as plays develop with two outs. Maybe you know, maybe you're going to work on your timing in terms of what you go out. Maybe you're going to work on, you know, the four components uh, that go into deciding whether you go out uh, to check on a high, on a fly ball. Maybe, maybe you're going to work on uh, making sure that you see a legal slide on a double. There's a million things to decide that you're going to, to focus on. But honestly, if you focus on one thing that you're going to get better at in one game and you have 200 games, you're going to be better. Two at 200 things at the end of that season. That's mind boggling. And that's huge improvement. So the numbers are in your favor as it relates to becoming a better umpire. If you take the right mental approach and if, if you can kind of hit some basic principles. So anyway, I hope this has been helpful. Probably went um, a bit longer than I wanted it to, but um, hopefully this is helpful to you in a COVID environment where you're having to get training as an individual rather than go to some of the major the camps or the, the workshops um, or the clinics that have traditionally been available to us. So this is just my way of trying to help us all um, in, a, in a COVID environment that um, doesn't take away baseball, thank heaven. It's a great game. Umpiring is a really difficult thing to do, but um, it's a great fraternity to be a part of. I'm honored to be a part of it. And I Wish all of you just an absolutely awesome season. Thanks so much.